Today's lecture will cover the January public forum topic related to U.S. diplomacy in West Asia. I'll introduce the resolution and discuss some terms, provide important background information, and then look at the pro and con arguments. Let's begin by looking at the resolution. Resolved, the United States federal government should increase its diplomatic efforts to peacefully resolve internal conflicts in West Asia. The three of the terms in the resolution are pretty self-explanatory, right? The United States is the country uh, that we live in, uh, and the United States federal government is uh, the government uh, of the United States. Should just means this is something we ought to do, not that we are doing it or that we would do it, but it's something we should decide to do. Increase simply means to make greater. Uh, the only reason I kind of really even mention the word increase is I've seen a lot of evidence that people are reading uh, that's just describing the current diplomatic efforts. That doesn't prove that we should increase it, that an increase would be effective. It's just something to think about when you're con. If the pro is reading a lot of evidence about current diplomatic efforts and how they are working, Right, You can point out that that just means that those should be continued and that there may be disadvantages to increasing it. Now, what diplomatic efforts to peacefully resolve. Uh, diplomacy can mean a lot of things. Generally, it's an alternative to war. Right, It's an alternative to fighting it out. It involves working through it. It can involve simply just asking nicely Right, to try to kind of talk people through a situation. Obviously, that's not usually enough, right? Because we're talking about, in the resolution, armed conflicts, right? These are serious kind of disagreements have. People have uh, seriously kind of mutually conflicting desires that they're willing to go to war for or at least engage in some level of conflict for. And asking them to kind of not continue the demand is not usually going to cut it. So basically, diplomacy involves a lot more than that. It usually involves both inducements, positive incentives, and threats, which are negative incentives, right? How might we induce somebody uh, to do something that we want? Well, we could offer them foreign aid. We could offer them foreign assistance. We could give them a security guarantee and say, hey, look, if you don't build these nuclear weapons, then we'll guarantee your security in the event of any attack. Those are, those are inducements. Threats, right? Uh, d diplomacy is an alternative to war, but that doesn't mean the United States can't threaten war in order to kind of prevent the outbreak of conflict, right? So look, you, <laughs> Russia arguably did this before the Ukraine war. They threatened the Ukraine. They said, look, if you do not, okay, commit to not joining NATO, we're going to attack you, right? So now they are at war, but before that, that threat of war, all right, was a, uh, was a form of diplomacy. It might include something like, uh, sanctions or a threat of sanctions, right? We're going to put on economic sanctions. Arguably, putting on economic sanctions before the war starts is even a, is even a, is even a form of diplomacy. And maybe after the war starts, and we've seen some arguments develop along these lines. What I want to stress here is diplomacy is more all right than just acting nicely. It can include positive and negative incentives and putting pressure on countries to do. Uh, what we want them to do in order to avoid conflict. Now, that pressure, of course, can hurt relations, which is where the con can generate a lot of arguments. So that's important to understand. Uh, that, that diplomacy might include foreign aid, which has generated some arguments on this topic. It might include security guarantees, which have generated arguments, and it might include sanctions, which have generated arguments. Now, the second thing is peacefully. What does it mean to do this kind of peacefully? Well, it, it, it kind of is arguably a little bit redundant, right? Diplomatic activity, okay, to peacefully resolve. We're trying to have a resolution before we go to war. It is useful to point out that there are kind of two modern conceptions of peace. One is negative peace, right? The absence of conflict, okay? We're just, there is no war. Positive peace refers to the idea that in order for there to be real peace, you have to you have to focus on human um human development, you have to reduce gender violence, um, just for example, right? So this can play out in a couple ways, right? First of all, the affirmative or the pro could take a, a an approach, arguably take an approach toward positive peace that could involve things like aid, regardless of whether or not 
ends included in diplomacy to strengthen societies. And the con could critique the affirmative for focusing too much on negative peace, which is how this argument originally started uh, in debate, in policy debate many years ago. You know, people would uh, have different plans that advocated for, uh, you know, undertaking a particular measure in order to stop a conflict between two countries. And the negative would critique that and say, well, hey, that's you're just focused on positive or excuse me, you're just focused on negative peace and not positive peace. And we really need to uh, focus on positive peace. So there are a couple terms here in the resolution, um, unlike the three previous terms uh, that are super important. They'll guide the directions of the debates um, in many in many different ways. Now, internal conflicts. There are a couple ways to interpret internal conflicts, right? There can be those within the societies, right? So you could take a particular country in West Asia, which we'll talk about in a minute, and think about whether or not the conflict kind of occurs like within those societies. Or you can think of those conflicts as being kind of with, within West Asia. In other words, like the conflicts between the countries in West Asia, which is really how most of the arguments have played out on this topic and kind of are developing. I think there is one kind of related question is, can the diplomacy involve significant external actors, right? Iran, as we'll talk about in, in, in a bit, is involved in a lot of these conflicts. So can arguing for increasing diplomacy with, with right, right, that's focused on uh, kind of re reducing the potential for armed conflict within West Asia include countries like Iran or Russia, which backs Iran, or China, which is always trying to kind of build its interest in the Middle East. A little bit debatable, obviously. Um, if you say, yes, it can include it, like, where do you draw the line, right? It can involve, like, there's you know lots of countries that are involved in different ways in the Middle East. If you say, no, it can't, um, then it's probably hard to resolve some of these conflicts. I think it's probably something the way it's going to get debated. It's just going to be, like, kind of something left unsaid, not addressed, um, that we'll have to kind of figure out how to, uh, that won't really come up, but it, the, in the evidence about diplomacy and diplomacy working, it'll kind of assume that, but teams won't really argue for it explicitly. Okay, West Asia. Where is West Asia? Well, West Asia is really in an area that most of you would probably, and most of <laughs> myself, right, would consider to be like the Middle East. Um, and it's really kind of in the Gulf area, uh, and just kind of above the Gulf area, right? So we see Saudi Arabia, Yemen, Oman, United Arab Emirates. Above that, we have Iraq, okay, Syria to the left of Iraq, Jordan, Israel, Lebanon, Turkey, Armenia, Azerbaijan. To the green there, close to the top right, that light green, that's Iran, okay? And Iran plays a very big role in these conflicts. Uh, before we move on and talk about a couple, I just want to highlight kind of on the map here, there is kind of a significant conflict, right, between um, kind of Saudi Arabia and internal actors in Yemen. Uh, at the moment, there's a divisive conflict between Sunnis and Shiites in, in Iraq, that in uh, Iran supporting the Shia side, we have conflicts within Syria and between Syria and Turkey. All right, there's conflicts between Israel and what we consider the Palestinian Authority, even though it's not a country, the West Bank and the Gaza Strip. All right, there's conflicts between uh, northern Cyprus and southern Cyprus, northern Cyprus being backed by Turkey. All right, there's a conflict between Armenia uh, and Azerbaijan, right? So I just want you to, I just point those out now, now so when you're looking at this map, uh, you can see kind of in totality um, where, where kind of the, the geographic uh, placement, the geographic placement of, the, of those conflicts. And on this slide, you know, I kind of just highlight those. Um, and I'll, I'll just say a couple more on these in particular instances. And then we'll, you know, we'll move on. This is just kind of the list of kind of many of the conflicts um, that exist. And, you know, you can download this presentation and kind of go back and look at this particular slide just for the list of conflicts. But I don't want to be redundant. I'm going to spend some time moving through each of these conflicts. Um, it. I don't want to make this too long, right? Be, but you need to understand like some of the, the 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 conflicts that are occurring in these countries and the relationships between them. The ones that I am highlighting are ones that have been debated kind of a, a lot, like to date in in the in the one of the tournaments that kind of happened that used the January topic. 
uh, right before the holiday break. So Saudi Arabia, Yemen. So the Saudi Arabia Yemen conflict is not really a conflict between Saudi Arabia and Yemen. It's a conflict between Saudi Arabia, backed by the United Arab Emirates, uh, kind of a little more explicitly, which are two Sunni governments. And I'll talk more later about the Sunni and the Shia, which are two major sects of Islam. They're actually backing the Yemeni government, okay? And starting in 2015, we had the Houthi rebels within Yemen try to overthrow the Yemeni government, which is also Sunni. And they are heavily backed by Iran, all right, in their efforts to kind of overthrow the government. The U.S. kind of is involved in this because the United States backs Saudi Arabia. The United States has a long historical relationship with Saudi Arabia that's intertwined with kind of our need for oil and their need for arms and just our ability to, our needs to project stability in the Middle East. Um, and we want stability in that region. And we've tried to restrain a little bit of the arms sales that they're using to kind of, uh, the, 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 that they're using really in most instances to supply, either supply to the Yemeni government or actual engage in like aerial bombings um, of the Houthi rebels. So the United States is kind of involved in this and indirectly. There have been various truces, but the most recent one has fallen through. It does have some potential to escalate, right? Because it's backed by Iran and then you have Iran, right? Like near Saudi Arabia and there's tensions between those those countries. Uh, Saudi Arabia, as I mentioned, is a, is a Sunni state. Iran is a Shia state, okay? One thing I will highlight is the conflict and the, and the breakdown of the truce has made it very difficult to deliver humanitarian aid. So even if it's difficult for diplomacy to solve this conflict entirely, it could, it, you know, some stronger diplomacy may make it possible to deliver humanitarian aid and to save lives. It is obviously difficult to resolve without Iran, right? It brings up the question of external actors, but maybe it comes in indirectly. What type of diplomacy might we have might like kind of encourage a ceasefire. We might put some pressure on Saudi Arabia to reduce their military support for the Yemeni government or to agree to a truce. We might put similar pressure uh, on Iran if that if that's topical. But it would obviously Iran would you know they're they're the major that'd be kind of like Russia and, and and the Ukraine negotiating kind of without like the United States involved in a, in any way. That would be kind of difficult to conceive of. Well, the same the same thing is true here. But obviously, that negotiations as I said earlier might be a bit indirect. Then we have Syria. Okay, the situation in Syria. Right. Is a bit complicated. And I, I put up this map because I also want you to see how close um, it is to Turkey and some of the other countries there. The Syria, Syria is ruled by the Assad family. It's, it's, and it's, it, it's, it's a Shia. It's a kind of a Shia based in the, the Shia religion. OK, uh, same with same with Iran. All right. Um, there was a rebellion in 2010 as part of the Arab Spring, which people it was kind of this fantasy that there were all these protests, you know, the Internet spread. So supposedly the Middle East would democratize. Well, this was violently crushed by Assad. OK, just violently crushed. And it resulted in a massive civil war. Hundreds of thousands of people died. Millions of refugees kind of spread out of Syria. Some of them went into Turkey. Some of them went into the Europe. Some of them ended up in Lebanon. OK, Russia and Iran both support Assad in cracking down on this. Um, but the U.S. backs some of the Sunni like opposition groups. And the U.S. even has a modest military presence uh, in Syria itself. The Kurds and the Syrian Democratic Forces in Syria um, that that Turkey is opposed to uh, do kind of aid in this fight, both kind of like kind of to check the power of the government, but also to check the power of ISIS, right? If you remember back a couple of years ago, there's this terrible, horrible terrorist group. All terrorist groups are bad, right? This was about to just get engaged in mass mass murders and stuff like that. Um, but these these groups are contain many, many Kurds, which is a, uh, the Kurdish people are a, a religious group, all right, that are, that, uh, that, Turkey, right, most of them are in Turkey, or at least a lot of them are in Turkey and are opposed to the Turkish government. Turkey considers, uh, <laughs> they, they don't like them at all, basically consider to, them to be terrorists. They think they're stirring up trouble on the border 
uh, between Turkey and Syria. And there's a lot of very recent evidence, including from today in the last couple days. Today is December 24th. All right. About how Syria wants to be aggressive. I mean, excuse me, how Turkey wants to be aggressive and basically attack uh, these Syrian democratic forces um, and what's considered the PKK, the, Kurd- the Kurdish Workers Party. Um, there's a big concern that if they do that, um, then that'll undermine the, com- the fight against ISIS because the U.S. and Syria relies on these groups to fight ISIS. All right. And if there's more also, if there's more instability in Syria, a lot of the, the ISIS fighters that are in Syria uh, could get out of jail and then ISIS could become a global threat again. So there's substantial evidence, there's significant evidence, including a really good piece of evidence from December 23rd uh, that I just posted on the Debate Us website that says that the United States needs to use diplomacy to restrain Turkey from engaging in this aggression. Now, it's quite complicated, right? Because the United, Turkey is kind of playing this like middle role in the, in the war over the Ukraine. They're like kind of supporting Russia. They're kind of supporting the United States, both in different ways. Turkey is a member of NATO, the North Atlantic Treaty Organization, which I'm sure you're well aware of if you, if you debated uh, either of last year's NATO topics. And the United States needs Turkey's support. All right. Right now, Sweden and Finland want to join the North Atlantic Treaty Organization. The United States wants them to join the North North Atlantic Treaty Organization. Most people say this will strengthen the North Atlantic Treaty Organization. But if any NATO member, right, one of which is Turkey, vetoes, all right, Turkey's inclusion in the North Atlantic Treaty Organization, then they cannot be part of the then they cannot be part of the North Atlantic Treaty Organization. So con teams could argue that putting more diplomatic pressure on Turkey means that they are not going to support the United the the, the inclusion of um, uh, uh, Finland and Sweden in, in NATO anymore, right? And th- th- this would be bad. It might also all like, maybe they'll decide not to uh, continue selling uh, Ukraine drones that they're using in their war against Russia. Maybe they'll allow more Russia, uh, uh, the, the Russia freedom of movement kind of uh, in the area that, that accesses the Black Sea. Maybe they'll negotiate oil deals on friendlier terms with Russia. Turkey has a lot of kind of... Uh, power right now to negotiate well, right? The United States as a country, as we'll talk about, has a lot of economic and military power that can enable to put pressure on countries and have a lot of influence. But the reality is if the Turkey, given the current geopolitical situation related to the war in the Ukraine, has a lot of power as well. Lebanon. Lebanon uh, is a country that, um, like I said, that's under a lot of pressure now because they host so many millions of refugees. So, right, there are resource conflicts, there are religious conflicts. Um, but they're basically kind of divided between the Christians and then the two uh, sects of Islam, the, the Sunnis and the Shiites, right? Okay, one, of what, one group is backed by Iran, the other group is backed by Saudi Arabia. So there's kind of a never present a uh, kind of a risk of a, of a civil war and there's kind of some evidence that at least suggests not with a lot of detail but the, the united states should gauge in diplomacy uh to, to try to prevent that outbreak of the conflict uh turkey which we just talked about probably should have talked about them before before we talked about lebanon but as i said they have internal conflicts with the kurds that uh, reside in turkey they have internal conflicts with christians that reside in turkey uh, they're in conflicts with Syria over water. There's a case that was read about water conflicts between Turkey and Syria. Uh, Turkey also supports Azerbaijan, and we'll talk about the Azerbaijan Armenia conflict later. Um, but you know, gauge in diplomacy. We can talk about how Turkey won't maybe won't attack Greece. That may be not part of an internal conflict, right? But they they could they could attack southern Cyprus. They really control northern Cyprus. They could, um, maybe you, we, we could get them to use, we could use some diplomacy to get them to reduce their support to Azerbaijan, maybe to be nicer to the Kurds and the Christians within Turkey. And as I just mentioned two slides ago, to get them to not intervene in the, uh, not intervene in Syria militarily. Um, as I was just re- referencing, okay, within Cyprus, Turkey controls northern Cyprus in the Greek Cypriot Republic of Cyprus. 
Um, they, Turkey does claim that Northern Cyprus is its own country, but they're the only country in the world uh, who kind of thinks this, and they retain a 35,000 per person army in the north. You can find some recent evidence about that kind of suggests that some diplomacy should be used to stop like this conflict from maybe escalating. Um, it's something I haven't seen in any of the cases that have been run so far, so it might kind of give you a little bit of a, a sleeper case or a surprise case. Armenia and Azerbaijan. Currently, this is like, so th there's a potential for tu Turkish in, in Yemen, right? Yemen and Saudi Arabia, in Yemen, right? There's this ongoing civil war supported by Saudi Arabia. There's probably a pretty reasonable risk that Turkey could begin an incursion uh, into Syria right now. And there's a high potential for conflict between Armenia and Azerbaijan over the Nargano Karabakh region. Um, there's been gunfire exchanged recently. Soldiers have died in September. I think a couple more died in November. There's, there's, there's potential that this could turn into an actual war. How? Like, wh where does this come from? Well, Armenia declared independence from Azerbaijan in, in 1991. Um, this Norbagana Karak region is ethnically Armenian. But it, it's, it's, it's part of Azerbaijan. Nobody really agrees that it is not. But Turkey supports, right, okay, so you have all these kind of ethnic Armenians living in this part of Azerbaijan, right? So you have inherent potential kind of for conflict, right? We kind of see the same things in like, you know, in the Ukraine, right, where there's kind of these Russian, you know, in Crimea, right, and these a couple of the other regions that... Russia's lead claim to there. There were a lot of there are and maybe were some, you know, with the war, obviously, some people have left. Right. Ethnic Russians like living in those areas who like uh, our identity is tied to Russia. Well, the same thing is these people's identity is it's tied to Armenia. OK. And they kind of like got it to work out like Russia has kind of restrained Azerbaijan. Excuse me, Russia has restrained Azerbaijan from attacking Armenia. But now as Russia is really obviously focused on the Ukraine war. They have peacekeepers there, but right, they can't pay much attention to this conflict. The U.S., Iran, and to, right, to a degree in the past, Russia supported Armenia. This is one thing like the United States and kind of Iran kind of like are working on. But there's been a lot of kind of recent fighting and hot conflict that has the potential to escalate uh, this war. Um, and it could obviously cause like a lot of like significant problems. So, um, you know, you're in an area here is a conflict potentially involving Russia, you know, Iran, the United States. Right. So not only could just take, create a war, uh, cause a war into itself, but it could kind of spill over and there are cards for uh, cards that suggest diplomacy. And this is a this is kind of a conflict that's that's like frequently talked about, I guess I should say, in, in a lot of pro cases. If you kind of just think or hear about the Middle East, right, you're kind of constantly hearing about the, the Israeli, right, Palestinian conflicts, right? Israel is the only Jewish state in the world. It was founded in 1948, right, after World War II, in response to many Jewish people throughout Europe and other places, Russia, other places in the Middle East, kind of wanting a homeland, right? Um, and it was founded in a territory that was kind of originally controlled um, by, by, by Muslim people as part of Palestine. Uh, the U.S. has said Palestine should be divided between Israel, uh, right, this land between Israel and Palestine. It was, it, it, was, did, it was kind of initially divided, but in 1967, Israel took control of the West Bank, which you can see here, in the Gaza Strip, all right, which was kind of a one-time like part of Palestine. And the West Bank is, is kind of technically under control over what we now consider to be the Palestinian Authority, which is an informal government. But Israel just kind of keeps expanding its settlements, right? Its, its settlements of, of Jewish people, right, into these areas. Um, and Gaza is also, Gaza, right, down there on the left in the yellow, right, is controlled by Hamas, which is backed by Iran and the U.S. considers a terrorist group. And I mean, when I mean controlled by, I don't mean like legally, they're just kind of running the show. And the U.S. is kind of always trying to restrain Israel from further expanding into these settlements, all right, and the U.S. is always trying to get like to kind of stop attacks from these territories like into Israel by groups like Hamas. Um, this obviously has a potential to escalate because Iran supports Hamas and these groups. 
And as I said, there's kind of constant intervention calls for the U.S. to intervene. We have strong ties to Israel. Recently, Israel elected kind of a very hardline government, um, right? And th those people are listed there. And there's kind of constant pressure. Um, now there's going to be even more pressure for Israeli kind of Israel internal political pressure for Israel to like expand the settlements, <clears throat> maybe step up kind of attacks in these regions to go after like terrorist groups. So there's like a lot of recent pressure for this kind of to escalate. And it could obviously escalate to a war potentially involved with Iran and potentially involving Iran. And there's a lot of kind of evidence that kind of says the U.S. should kind of use diplomacy to try to restrain Israel, right, to try to kind of reduce these terrorist attacks, um, maybe indirectly, as I keep talking about, to get, to get Iran to reduce its, its support. Um, so this is kind of another area that, that's kind of common in many pro cases. And then that little description of Palestine there, just to kind of give you the history. All right, I just, I just took that from Wikipedia. You can read that yourself. Maybe you may have been reading it over now. All right, and you can obviously download uh, this PowerPoint presentation. In terms of the Israel-Arab conflict, so Arab countries such as Saudi Arabia, Oman, the UAE, kind of all led kind of by, like I say, kind of Sunni, Sunni governments, right? They've kind of supported kind of Palestine in the past and the Palestinian interests, but given the threat that Iran has posed to these countries, they kind of aligned with Israel, right? And we now have the, you know, the Arab Accords, which is the other potential topic, essentially, right? Uh, between Israel and it, at least two of the two of these like Sunni uh, governments, the UAE and Bahrain, but Israel, Israel, like even though it hasn't entered kind of accords with all these countries, its relationships with Saudi Arabia and, and all these kind of Arab countries in the Gulf have improved radically because they need to kind of, they have this common enemy in of Iran. So there's maybe some potential here for arguments. I haven't seen anybody put it in a case just because like. The relationships between Israel and the Arab states are like pretty strong now, but maybe you could argue for like strengthening these accords. I don't, I don't think it's a great pro advantage just because there's not much uniqueness that says there's much of a problem. But maybe you could argue for strengthening in some way, using diplomacy to build and strengthen those ties in some way that maybe would increase um, their joint ability to deter Iran. Iraq. I mean, look. Everybody kind of knows, uh, you know, you have a sense, uh, you know, I know some of you are younger, right? Like the U.S. involved in Iraq for a very long time. OK, and this goes back to way back in the early 1990s when I was a college student. OK, and Iraq invaded Kuwait and the U.S. used military power to push Iraq out of Kuwait. That followed. OK, Iraq, you know, that was just many, one of the many conflicts that Iraq had in the region, right? Like. 90, right in, 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 in before they invaded Kuwait, right? They invaded Iran, right? So you had this tension. You had a Sunni Sunni led government in Iran. You had Shia led government in Iraq. They had a long war. It lasted eight years. Basically, kind of ended up with everybody having the same borders. But horrible things happened. Like chemical weapons were used. There were mass atrocities. Okay, and then, like I say, Iraq invaded Kuwait. The United States, a coalition, like kind of pushed them out. It was mostly the United States. And then after that, there were a lot of rebellions within Iraq, right? Especially by the Shia-led groups and the Kurds. And Saddam Hussein, who was in charge of Iraq, like just suppressed those rebellions. Again, even using chemical weapons. People say he used chemical weapons against its own, his own people, right? There were certainly his own citizens. They weren't really, mem obviously, members of different religious groups. Um, so it depends on how you define his own people. But... Um, that's what happened. That led to a lot of sanctions on the on on Iraq, which kind of really arguably killed like a lot of people, like in you know obviously indirectly. And then in two thousand three, the United States toppled I Saddam, which unsurprisingly and oddly in a strange way <laughs> was not anticipated by the United States, triggered, triggered a massive civil war. Right, the central government collapsed. The U.S. the U.S. sent all these like. Western bureaucrats in there to try to try to put together a government, but there's huge religious conflicts between the Sunnis, the Shiites, and the, and the and the Kurds, and this caused like a massive civil war. Especially as the the Shias started within there started to gain power and got the backing had the backing of Iran, they started killing a lot of the Sunnis. All right, it was kind of a bit of a disaster. The U.S. sent military forces back in, and to, more you know we always kind of maintained a military presence. 
but sent more military forces back in in 2007 to try to kind of kind of repress uh, this conflict, and it did work a little bit. But uh, there's been election of a new government. Uh, the, the president and the prime minister are listed there. They, there's a lot of Shia influence in the in the new government now, and a lot of people think that they're not. I don't know about a lot of people, but some people think that this is just going to. Uh, they're not going to maintain this government coalition, and, you're, and especially given the, the pressure that Iran is putting on, and you might have another civil war. And there's calls for more U.S. diplomacy uh, to resolve this. Now, we talk about some con- conflicts within countries and between countries, right? But there are kind of underlying kind of dynamics here that are affecting things, right? We have Conflicts between the Sunni and the Shiite, which I'll talk a little bit more in a minute. We t- conflicts between the Arabs and the Israelis, which have died down, but is still present, right? All right, we have conflicts between uh, you know Arab, all the Arab Muslims and Christians, right? We have co- between the, the Kurds and Muslims and Christians. You have block alignments, which we're starting to see, right? You have Iran, Syria, Shia, large large kind of Shia uh, kind of influenced and run uh, run countries. Right back by Russia, and then you have the U.S. is kind of more backing the Sunni-led uh, governments, which you know the countries are probably a little more stable at this point, a little more like Westernized, right? And they're kind of aligned a little bit with Israel, and of course, all this underlies right their religious conflicts, but there are also conflicts over which groups get to kind of control access to the resources, right? And when you control access to the resources, um, that that kind of that makes a difference. Now, I do want to say I've talked a lot about the Sunni-Shiite conflict. So I want to emphasize, like, I want to talk about this conflict um, because it it, it does underlie a lot of the the regional dynamics and a lot of the conflicts. It's really a conflict that began 1,400 years ago, okay? And it's after the birth, it's after the death of the prophet Muhammad. Uh, The Sunnis thought his followers, right, should be able to choose, like, their successor, kind of like, you know, not, I mean, not like a formal popular vote, but like, Okay, a, a vote. Um, and the Shia thought his cousin should be the successor. So that was kind of what this original conflict is about. And these obviously these two sects are kind of now at war. But as I said, this is over, all overlapped but with politics, economics, historical animosities, right? Um, 85% of Muslims are Sunni, but Shia are the majority in Iraq, Iran, Bahrain, and, and Azerbaijan. Okay, so it's incredibly... So, and, you know, there's evidence, there's a, there's a card from Henry Kissinger, right, uh, in, in the file that says that this conflict between the Sunnis and the Shiites and the way the United States and Russia have kind of played out the dynamic could, could generate uh, a huge war. All right, now, obviously, based on listening to the lecture up until this point, you have some ideas as to what the pro and con arguments are. Uh, but let's kind of unpack them kind of in a couple of different ways. First of all, let's talk about the assumptions of the U.S. role. What do I mean by this? Well, why does anyone think the United States would be effective at resolving these conflicts? Well, the United States has a lot of diplomatic resources, right? Like we can afford to send negotiators overseas. And a lot of these negotiators, you know, have a lot of expertise, right? They've been involved in this kind of career of diplomacy for their entire lives, and they have experience with these regions. The United States also has a lot of economic power and military power, right, that we can use, as I discussed originally in kind of discussing what diplomacy is, right, that we can use to kind of induce or threaten uh, people to get what we want, which in this case kind of is a peaceful resolution of these potential armed conflicts. And of course, the idea, too, is that we're an external actor, right? Like, we definitely have interests in these regions, which, of course, will the, you know, each side will point out, hey, maybe you're more interested in, in helping one side than the other, right? But we're kind of a, at least a quasi-neutral uh, third party. I want to start by highlighting some general advantage areas. First, we have all the conflicts that I just discussed, and which I'll highlight again on the next slide, just visually so you can see. We already talked about them, right? The conflicts between the countries in West Asia, that's mostly what we discussed. And then, of course, there's conflicts within the countries, right? And we talked about some of those too, right? There's a lot of religious conflicts between the Sunnis and the Shiites and the Kurds and the Christians uh, within these countries. And there's also kind of some broader issues. Um, You know, there's a piece of evidence in one of the cases that was read at Blake that says, oh, this uprising for democracy and 
Now, the Ukraine is going to spill over to the Middle East uh, is a good piece of evidence. I haven't really seen anything else that makes that argument. And given how effective uh, these governments have been in suppressing um, the, these uh, internal uprising, that seems unlikely. But maybe the U.S. needs to use a little diplomacy in there to kind of prevent that from happening. Obviously, some of these groups, right, like certain people obviously define them as religious groups or their supporters, right? The United States considers to be some of these to be terrorists who attack other interests, you know, um, whether they be in Israel, like Saudi Arabia, right? It'd be terrorist attacks uh, in the region. So there's kind of the conflicts between the countries. There's conflicts within the countries that manifest themselves in kind of repression, like rights violations uh, and terrorism. Then I think uh, 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 the next thing is, is a bit distinct. There's some good evidence that says if the U.S. can kind of diplomatically keep the lid on, on these conflicts, so to sp- uh, the lid, so to speak, on these conflicts in the Middle East, then it'll be able, we'll be able to free up some of our military resources to, to deploy uh, to East Asia to kind of check the growth of China, which has kind of always uh, been a desire of the United States all the way back uh, to the Obama administration. Successfully resolving some of these conflicts, or at least keeping the lid on them, can uh, kind of strengthen U.S. global leadership in soft power. It may enable us to promote democracy and rights. Uh, generally, democracy promotion is obviously a, a lot debatable. I added all the democracy promotion files uh, into the folder uh, for this topic on Debate Us. There's water conflicts um, that, that are in this region that may need to get resolved. There's been a lot of debate arguments over time about water wars and how to resolve them. I'm cleaning up those files and moving them into the folder as well. And then there's kind of a general argument about uh, reductions in military presence, right? I talked earlier about how this would free up U.S. military resources to go to East Asia to deter China. Well, it may be good to get those resources out of the Middle East. Maybe they're causing wars in the Middle East. Maybe they're causing human rights violations in the Middle East. I mean, it caused same of those problems uh, to kind of recreate themselves in East Asia. And some of them would, right? Like people, people read arguments about U.S. military bases and sexual assault, environmental problems. Those will kind of Th- those are as likely to happen in East Asia as they are in the Middle East, okay? But also the reality is is that the U.S. military presence is more welcome in, in, in Japan and South Korea and Taiwan, certainly at least relative to the Middle East. So some of the kind of the opposition uh, to the U.S. military presence kind of won't be as strong there, and it's arguably a little more workable. These conflicts kind of between countries externally, I already, already talked through, so I'm not going to talk through them again. I just put them all on the slide so you can see them all in the conflicts and maybe go back uh, and when, if you download the presentation to review the slides. There's some other arguments that I've seen in, in cases that have been run so far. Um, the first is that if, if diplomacy includes security guarantees, the United States could provide more security guarantees to Saudi Arabia, right? Saudi Arabia is worried about Iran. As a result of that worry, they may choose to develop nuclear weapons. They choose to develop nuclear weapons that could create a cause lead to a cascade of nuclear proliferation uh, throughout the Middle East, which could cause uh, a lot of problems, could cause wars. It could cause them to turn to China. China could increase its influence. That influence may be bad. There's a couple areas where people are defining foreign aid. Uh, or foreign aid as part of diplomacy and then say, well, we should give aid to address like gender violence and climate uh, change. That seems like a little bit of a stretch. But look, it, it's not it's not just like an it's not foreign aid for any random project. Right. Like if climate change is going to cause conflicts over resources. Right. Even if the climate is just moving and you believe like we can adapt and people can go live in different places. Well, when one group goes to live in a place that's occupied by another group. That causes conflicts, all right? There's always gender violence in this world. Unfortunately, it's terrible. It's a form of violence. It's a form of conflict. It needs to be addressed. So that 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 those foreign aid, right, or those types of foreign aid are <laughs> related to avoiding armed conflict. And if you remember back to the discussion of peace and negative peace and positive peace, they certainly represent components of positive peace. And I think you could make a compelling argument that we shouldn't just focus on negative peace. Okay, well, the con. What's the con? It seems like these conflicts are horrible and <laughs> the United States should just do what it can, even if it's limited. To con- First, I want to talk about some of the problems that are kind of um, limited to 
Uh, there are just limits to diplomacy, right? These are defensive arguments. They're not offensive arguments, really. Maybe the last one is a little bit as to why diplomacy is bad. Um, but there are kind of limitations to its effectiveness. The first is that diplomacy is hard. And the U.S. has historically failed at this in the region, right? Like, I mean, the United States has been trying to negotiate peace between the Israelis and the, the Palestinians since the formation of Israel, right, back in 1948. And obviously, there have been a lot of, a lot of conflicts. So we've been trying to make peace between the Arabs and the Israelis, which has been a little bit more effective, but more probably driven by the fact that they have this mutual enemy of Iran. We've been trying to stop the violence in Iraq for decades, right? Now, look, the flip side of this is you could argue without the United States, it would be a lot worse. Okay, but obviously U.S. diplomacy, we, we, we have ongoing diplomacy in this region, a lot of it, and it's been uh, of limited effectiveness. And so how much is increasing it really going to help? Second, conflicts are external to, right, to the, to the particular events in this region, right? As I already said, we have Sunnis and Shiites living kind of all over, all over the Middle East. You a, a huge Shia government-led government in Iran, Right. You have Christians like in the United States backing like Christians in Turkey. The United States is a really largely a Judeo Christian country, which defaults to siding to Israel and considers Hamas backed by Iran as a terrorist group, where some people who live in that area think like Hamas um, is their savior. You have Russia who like, you know, wants oil, wants economic ties, wants to challenge the U.S. presence in the region and the U.S. ties to some of these governments who have China with similar concerns, China need access to energy, China wants economic development, they want to cooperate with oil rich kingdoms like Saudi Arabia, right? So they're kind of influencing this. So all these external forces limit the effectiveness of kind of what the United States is doing unilaterally, like by itself in this particular region and in particular instances, because all those instances are at least incredibly influenced and in many cases just controlled by outside events. Third, as I mentioned at the beginning of the talk, a lot of the evidence describes the status quo, right? It's just talking about diplomacy we're doing now and how it works. It doesn't mean it should be increased. Fourth, a lot of the evidence that like people read is kind of old. It's like from 2018, 2020, even 2021. This doesn't assume the Ukraine war. Why is this important? Like, as I mentioned, it's hard for the United States to engage in any diplomacy with Turkey right now. And Turkey has a big role in like conflicts like in northern Cyprus, OK, in in Syria. If the U.S. were actually to put so much pressure on Turkey to do this, it would cause a lot of problems. And, and Turkey knows the United States ultimately whatever threats it makes. Right. Whatever. You know, it's not going to attack Turkey. It, it's a NATO ally and like all these kind of all we're just never going to attack Turkey. Right. So in any kind of economic threats, sanction threats, all these kind of things, Turkey, Turkey's not going to take these credibly because Turkey knows the United States needs it. Right. So how are you going to resolve conflicts in Yemen? Iran is just very aggressive right now. You know, they're, they're, you arguably we can't topically even engage with diplomacy with them. How are you going to resolve conflicts in the Gaza Strip if they're funding terrorist activity and transferring drones and like weapons like into the Gaza Strip? The United States has been trying to negotiate um between the Houthis and Iran and Saudi Arabia since 2015. And that conflict is still ongoing, right? Um, and now you have kind of the, you know, the, the influence of Turkey in, in a growing economic power of China, right? The United States can only push Saudi Arabia so far because if not, it can get a lot of what it gets from the United States from China. So reading older evidence doesn't really prove that much. I think the fifth problem, and this, this needs some more unpacking, and I'd like to actually develop an argument around this. If the U.S. just increased its diplomacy, it's probably going to, right, it, at the very least, it's going to be perceived and probably would back like Israel and the Sunnis against like Shia interests. If that diplomacy succeeds in a way that benefits the Sunnis and suppresses the Shia, you could kind of take the side of the Shia and say, no, no, like, we're, we're kind of right about this. You should, right? Like, well, our interests will be lost. We'll be suppressed. Like, these governments will suppress us. They'll invade us. They'll overtake us. They'll take our resources, right? Um, and, and you know, it, it's not really a completely balanced approach, but which not only pollutes it in a way that makes the diplomacy difficult, but it pollutes it in a way that, like, could really disadvantage a lot of the other groups uh, in the Middle East. Offense. Where are we going to get our offense from? There's a couple of different categories. One, this first category is just kind of a list of kind of some different types of offense. And in the next slide, I'm going to kind of talk about relations and then impact turns. 
The first is the U.S. only has like so many diplomatic resources. We only have so much money. We only have so much staff. We only have so much focus and attention. A lot of people are making the argument, and there's just great specific link evidence that says this diplomatic focus would trade up, <coughs> excuse me, with the focus we need to keep on China to prevent them from attacking Taiwan. You can make a similar argument about the Ukraine, right? The U.S. is heavily engaged there, both militarily and diplomatically, and we, we don't like kind of want our attention to shift. The second is there's a good rearmament argument. A lot of teams are arguing this on the con. There's a lot of great evidence in the context of the Houthis that, hey, if there's a ceasefire, the Houthis will just use this to rearm. rearm. They're not going to give up. They're not going to agree to they'll ultimately agree to any peace deal. He's going to use this a time to rearm and attack again. People make this argument constantly in the context of the Ukraine. They say if you have a ceasefire or a peace deal with Russia right now, they'll just make the time to rearm. There's also an older argument. I, I think it's by Lutwick, and I'm trying to find the source. Um, that's older evidence, like all the way back, like from the late 90s, early 2000s. But this author, and I guess I'm trying to find the article, says that it's better to let like internal civil conflicts just burn out, right? Rather than kind of use diplomacy and have the United States get involved and take sides, it just all makes it a lot worse. So I'm really hoping to find that evidence and get it published on the website. Some teams are arguing that China is actually better than this. And if the U.S. goes in there, it's going to crowd out China and China is like more effective now, diplomacy, look, they don't have to bring the bad history the United States does to the region. They're not perceived as a Judeo-Christian um, kind of empire. So maybe they are better. They might be better at resolving like some of these disputes. Some people say that uh, PMCs, those are private military corporations. When we deploy diplomats, we use a lot of private military corporations to provide security. And those organizations engage in human rights abuses. Many of the contractors that work for them engage in sexual assault. There are a lot of problems. Uh, you can argue that promoting democracy is bad. It undermines governments. It really doesn't work. It causes transition wars. There's huge criticisms of democracy promotion. And then there's an argument that regional diplomacy, it's better if the countries just handle themselves to their own organizations like the Gulf Cooperation Council and they just kind of work it out, and then you can combine this with an argument that U.S. influence, hegemony, leadership is bad, um, can cause a lot of problems. Now, then there's a whole set of arguments. Um, then there are a few, excuse me, a few other arguments that fit into this category. There's an argument about sanctions, as I mentioned earlier. There's an argument that says if um, that diplomacy includes sanctions on countries and sanctions don't work and they destroy economies and they impoverish people. I mean, we have massive sanctions on Russia right now. And a lot of people say it's only reduced their economic growth rate by about 3%. And they're doing okay. There's, there's plenty of, you know, instances where sanctions have not like produced any kind of change and it caused like you a lot of humanitarian problems. It's really hard to win that like sanctions are on balance desirable. If there was a resolution that said sanctions are on balance desirable, the con would win almost all the debates. The only time they would win, the pro would win is when they were just substantially better at debating than the other team. It wouldn't have anything to do with the arguments. Uh, you can make arguments as to why U.S. military presence is bad if diplomacy, like if diplomacy includes the threat, right, of an attack. Maybe that involves deploying some forces overseas, um, and that could be bad. And you could argue that peacekeepers are bad. There were, there's a past policy topic about peacekeepers, peacekeeping, expanding peacekeeper operations are huge criticisms of. Um, Peacekeeping operations are not really effective. The, the peacekeepers commit crimes, engage in sexual violence, like take the wrong side, like engage in organized crime, like loot the countries. Um, there are just a lot of criticisms. If diplomacy involves peacekeeping, you can say that argue that peacekeeping is bad. Then there's this whole set, as I was kind of mentioning earlier, about relations. And if you put pressure on countries, it can hurt. It can hurt relations, right? Turkey, as I mentioned, as I mentioned this many times, you put pressure on Turkey, it's going to hurt relations uh, relations with them, which makes it harder to manage Russia. It makes it harder to get Sweden and Finland into NATO. It may be hard to get it make it harder to deal with the Azerbaijan issue. It may make them more likely to attack Syria, depending if you're pressuring them on something else. Uh, U.S. relations with Saudi Arabia. The top right, there's a link card that like one team read it Blake to this argument, but it's it's pretty straightforward and simple, right? Try putting pressure on Saudi Arabia to reduce its activities in Yemen. Military support for the Yemeni government, like it, it's going to cause problems in our relationships with Saudi Arabia. If we put pressure on Israel not to go after Hamas, it's going to hurt uh, in other groups and expand the settlements. It's going to hurt relations with Israel, and it could hurt relations with with. China, right? It could maybe this China 
uh, wants ties with Saudi Arabia if the U.S. puts more pressure on China, um, excuse me, puts more pressure on Saudi Arabia, not only may it likely turn to China, but this could hurt uh, U- U.S.-China relationships. There are critiques. Critiques are not as uh, common in public forum debate, but we have seen some critiques, right? It makes some sense on this topic, right? There's a, an Orientalism argument um, written by, uh, or <laughs> written by the, the debate argument, not per se, but uh, a book called Orientalism written by Edward Said that argued that kind of the idea that the United States basically in the West can go in uh, and fix things in the Middle East is based on like a lot of false, like racist assumptions and that it's just never going to work and it's going to produce... Uh, horrible consequences and kind of obviously literature about imperialism fits into that. As I said, there's the positive peace argument, uh, which I'm surprised hasn't been utilized more. But, you know, sometimes things just take, you know, if there was a policy, <laughs> if there was a policy debate topic that had the word peace in it, everybody would kind of be reading this critique. Uh, sometimes it just it just takes a while for argu- most arguments. The epic debate kind of originally started uh, in policy debate and kind of made their way into other events. This one just kind of hasn't really made it full blown into PF yet, but it'll it'll get there maybe by the end of this topic. It's directly related, right? And it's the idea that if you you know just focus on negative piece, you're not really focusing on the positive side of what you need to improve life. Capitalism, I've seen this argued like once uh, at the Blake tournament. Um, it's a super popular argument in policy and LD. Uh, which just kind of basically, in, in this case, you're going to say U.S. diplomacy, it's going to promote economic openness, um, the capitalist markets, we're going to try to use markets to solve problems, build trade ties, that increases capitalism, capitalism bad. And somebody uh, read a Borders critique, which has been in debate forever, um, which says that, like, look, the, the big cause of, uh, it says a lot of things, but one of the things it says is that a big cause of conflict is these artificial borders which are really created by outside powers over kind of the course of history. And given how artificial these borders are, we're never going to be able to solve conflict. And of course, the, the LD topic is open borders. So any program that has LDers and PF or kids who have kind of done a little bit of both, it's kind of obvious where this argument comes from. We do have all these critiques and all the answers available uh, to our subscribers. A few other arguments. First one is oil prices. I'm surprised this hasn't made it into debates. I haven't seen it anywhere. Maybe it has. Uh, PF debaters love to debate about oil prices. Um, there, and there's a common popular policy argument that says that kind of low-level conflict in the Middle East is kind of good because it basically builds in a price premium to oil, right? Like insurance rates for oil transport, discovery, all right, acquisition, drilling, transportation, Right. Those are high because there's always a potential to conflict. There is a built in risk of like a supply cutoff from like oil. And that kind of just pushes the price up higher than it otherwise would be. And higher oil prices make it more likely, more cost effective for us to trans uh, to kind of transition to renewable forms of energy like solar and wind, uh, which are going to solve climate change. Uh, Dedevelopment, just the old argument that economic collapse is good. Um, Versus bad, right? Like if there's a war in this region, it, it could destroy the global economy, especially if uh, oil supplies are disrupted. Maybe we need an economic decline. All those files are uh, uh, all those files are available on the website. And then, of course, we have, you know, basically China war good and Russia war good. Just basically say we need to go to war with Russia now rather than later. We're inevitably going to go to war with them. So it's better to fight them now. So. Uh, those arguments are not great. Um, they're kind of hard to win. Um, I don't think they're very good at all. But if you can uh, basically engage in some real reasonable risk calculus, but um, those arguments are available and not impossible to win. So uh, they may creep up in the debates. So anyhow, that's a lot of information. Um, but uh, there are a lot of arguments on this topic and it is kind of interesting. And I wish you the best of luck debating it.